Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining today's webinar that's being brought to us by GreenTraderTax.com on tax treatment on financial products updated for 2018. I'm very pleased to have Robert Green with us here today to deliver uh, today's presentation. So with that, Robert, what I am going to do is pass you the controls, and let's get underway here today. Uh, thanks for joining us, Robert. Take it away. Thank you, Cynthia. Let me just uh, minimize screen and go into slide mode. Okay, thank you everyone for coming today. We're gonna to discuss tax treatment on financial products. You know, you trade different types of instruments and they have different tax treatments. Some are capital gains, some are ordinary, some you can elect 475 on, some are subject to war sales, some get the lower 60, 40 rates. It covers the gamut and you need to know what you're trading to see what the effect is. Sometimes you can override a 1099B, so you want to know what you're entitled to. I'm Robert A. Green, a certified public accountant, CPA. I'm managing member of GNM Trader Tax, which is our CPA firm, Green, Neuschwander, and Manning, LLC, and CEO of Green Trader Tax, our website and content company. Uh, people consider me a leading authority on trader tax. I'm the author of Green's 2018 Trader Tax Guide, which has been published every year since 1997. The 2018 edition discusses the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act impact on investors, traders, and investment managers. The regulations for that qualified business income pass-through deduction just came out last week. I have a blog posting tomorrow about how it affects traders. I'm a contributor to Forbes magazine, and you'll see me with leading brokerage firms like today with interactive brokers. This information is educational. It's not intended to be a substitute for specific individualized tax, legal, or investment planning advice. Where you need that advice, you should consult a tax advisor, CPA, attorney, financial planner, or investment manager. Now, I, Robert Green, and the Green Companies, we are not affiliated with interactive brokers. We're a CPA firm. Interactive Brokers is a brokerage firm. Here's a description of today's webinar. We're going to talk about the tax treatment on the various financial products, the one, you know, securities, which happen to be subject to war sale loss adjustments, Section 1256 contracts, including your futures and broad base indexes, options of several types, ETFs, ETNs, volatility products. Forex, foreign futures, precious metals, swap contracts, and even cryptocurrencies. So we have a lot packed in here, but it's nice and concise. So you're going to, this is the, the main concepts that you need to focus in on. Let's start with securities. Now you need to watch out for the higher tax rates because you're paying that ordinary rate. If you have a long-term capital gain held 12 months, it's a lower rate, but a lot of traders are not holding long-term. You gotta watch out for those wash sales. Those are those uh, losses that you have to defer or lose permanently with an IRA because you buy it back within 30 days. Gotta watch out for the capital loss limitation. You're only allowed 3,000 of a loss against other income. And you have accounting challenges. You have to report line by line every trade with the war sale loss adjustment on your tax return. Securities include a lot of items. It includes your equities, both U.S. and foreign equities, otherwise you're known as stocks, your equity or stock options. Narrow-based indexes where the index is made up of nine or fewer securities. Indexes usually trade on commodities exchanges. Most of them are broad-based. You know, the S&P 500, the NASDAQ 100, the Russell. They're, they're broad-based. If it's nine or fewer, it's narrow-based. There are a few of those. And then, of course, the option on the narrow-based indexes. So these are your securities. Your exchange-traded funds, your ETFs, when they're structured as registered investment companies, those are securities. Options on securities ETFs structured as registered investment companies. ETNs when they're structured as debt instruments. Now, most of them are not. Most of them are prepaid forward contracts like the VXX, but the ones that are structured as debt instruments are securities. 
bonds, mutual funds, single stock futures. Again, you really want to know what's a security and what's not because if you're doing wash sale loss adjustments, those are on securities, not on other types of instruments. If you want a 470, if you made a 475 election on securities only, which is usually what people want to do, then it only relates to securities. So it only relates to something that's on this list. Now, normally you have short term versus long term capital gains and losses. With the default realization, otherwise known as the cash method, that's when you realize it, when you sell it. That's when you report your realized gains and losses on securities for the tax year. That gives you the ability to defer unrealized gains and losses on open securities positions at year end. So you can do tax loss selling at year end to realize the losses, but you can let the profits run through year end so you don't recognize the gains. Now, short-term capital gains are taxed at the ordinary tax rates, currently up to 37% for 2018 with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act's new lower rates. You got the marginal rates on ordinary income. The highest ordinary rate is 37%. That's when you hold for less than 12 months. If you hold for more than 12 months, you have a long-term capital gains rate. It's 0%, 15% for all the other brackets except the lowest two, and the highest bracket is 20%. It's almost half off. So it's nice to get a long-term capital gain, and you do that on your investments. You may not do that on your active trading, but you may have an investment portfolio as well, and it's on securities held 12 months. But again, anytime you hear the word security, you have to watch out for your wash sale loss adjustments. Congress doesn't want taxpayers to realize tax losses that are not economic losses in the eyes of the IRS. If you close a securities transaction and reopen it right away, in the eyes of the IRS, you haven't really economically closed your financial position on that security. They think you're doing tax loss selling and getting right back into it. Now, at year end, many taxpayers do the tax loss selling of securities in December. And the IRS wash sale rules defer the loss if the taxpayer repurchases a substantial identical position within 30 days before or after, which means into January of the subsequent year. That's why your broker waits until February to give you the 1099B, because if you buy something back in January for a loss you took in December, they may defer that loss on your 1099B through year end, which could raise your tax bill. So you want to avoid that. You want to deal with it up front. You don't want a nasty surprise at tax season. So it's 30... Keep in mind, 30 days before or after is an eternity for day of swing traders. Now, keep in mind, there are different IRS rules for brokers versus taxpayers. Section 1091, which is the wash sale loss rules, they require taxpayers to calculate wash sales based on substantially identical positions. That means between equity and equity options at different expiration dates. That's different from the rules for brokers that require identical positions, the same symbol. So on your broker 1099B, if you're trading Apple, they're only calculating a wash sale between the Apple symbol. If you also trade Apple options, they're not calculating a wash sale between Apple equity and Apple equity options or Apple equity options between December and January. They're just not doing it because the IRS doesn't require them to. They're following the rules that the IRS has for them, which happen to differ. There's apples and oranges, and that's very unfortunate. Most people would think a 1099B is exactly what they need to report on a tax return. In fact, they're afraid to depart because they don't want IRS questions. I wish the IRS would fix it. They have not done so to date. And there's a second difference. Brokers calculate wash sales per the individual one account, whereas taxpayers must calculate wash sales across all accounts, including IRAs. So if you have an IB individual account, an IB IRA account, an IB joint account, and you also have another brokerage account, well, 
IB is not going to communicate with the other broker for wash sales, and IB doesn't have to look at wash sales across all your accounts, but you have to do that. So you need to avoid wash sales between taxable accounts and IRA accounts. That's the first order of business. Consider a do not trade list to avoid permanent wash sale losses between taxable and IRA accounts throughout the tax year. So year to date, if you've been trading symbol XY in your taxable account and also trading that same symbol or options on that symbol in your IRA accounts, you or your spouse if you're filing joint, including Roth IRAs, you're not going to get the loss in the taxable account because it's a wash sale there. And it deferred the loss to the replacement position, which happens to be in your IRA, and there's no way to record it in the IRA. So you're never going to get that loss. It's permanently lost. So with a do not trade list, you can solve that problem for the rest of the year. You can trade tech stocks in a taxable account and energy stocks in an IRA. Now, Avoid wash sales in taxable accounts. Break the chain on wash sale losses at year end. So let's say you're not trading substantial identical positions in your IRA throughout the year. So you don't have the problem all year long. Sure, you have wash sales all year long, January, February, March, in your taxable account. It keeps punting the loss to the next month, next position. What you really mostly should focus on is breaking the chain on those losses at year end, getting out of the position in December and not getting back into it for 30 days. So you break the chain. You sell XY equity on December 20th at a loss and you don't repurchase it, the equity or the equity options until January 21st. So you fix the problem with the IRAs by not but with the do not trade list, and you fix the problem in your taxable accounts with breaking the chain. Now, if we recommend an accounting solution for wash sales. Now, keep in mind, if you have multiple brokerage accounts, including taxable and IRA on the individual level, and you trade and or even if you have just one account and you trade equities and equity options, you know you have an apples and oranges problem where you're going to have a difference with the broker. That's when you should consider using trade accounting software, a program like TradeLog, or our firm's trade accounting service where we use a professional license to trade log. You just download all your trades into the accounting program, calculate wash sale loss adjustments in an IRS compliant manner across all accounts, properly account for Section 1256 contracts, and generate the tax forms 8949 and 6781. You can run a potential wash sale loss report at year end and know the ones you have to break the chain on. Now, the best way of all to fix the wash sale loss problem is to elect 475 mark-to-market accounting. Traders eligible for trader tax status should consider a 475 election on securities. If you don't have trader tax status, you're not entitled to make a 475 election. 475 securities trades are exempt from the wash sale loss adjustments. They're ordinary gain or loss. They're not capital gain or loss, so they're also exempt from the capital loss limitation. That's always been the best way to avoid wash sales, and that's something we've advocated going back to when the 475 rules were opened up to traders in 1997 by Congress. That's when greentradertax.com really took off, and that was our claim to fame, was making the 475 election, the tax loss insurance. All right, that's securities. It's a headache, the war sales, more line-by-line -line reporting. The Section 1256 contracts are simpler. The traders, first of all, have a tax break. They enjoy the lower... 60-40 tax rates. These are the futures and other instruments. So the lower 60-40 capital gains rate, 60% is long-term capital gains. There's summary tax reporting. You don't have the line-by-line -line reporting. There's no wash sales. You don't need an accounting program. So your Section 1256 contracts include 
U.S. futures, these are your regulated futures contracts that trade on U.S. exchanges, whether they're in the currencies, the metals, the energies, the agriculturals, the financials, what, or even crypto. Whatever there's a regulated futures contract on a U.S. futures exchange, you can rest assured it's a contract border of exchange that it's 1256. Options on those futures. The same. Now, foreign futures are different. By default, they're not 1256, but some foreign exchanges have gotten a CFTC approval letter to market to Americans and gone a step further to get IRS approval to use 6040. We'll cover the details on that later. This is a big area. Broad-based indexes. A broad-based indexes is one that is made up of 10 or more securities. Don't confuse it with the ETF. So I'm not, I'm not talking about the SPY ETF trading on a securities exchange. I'm talking about an index, an e-mini index, a NASDAQ 100, S&P 500, Russell 2000, I'm talking about the indexes that trade on futures exchanges. Ten or more underlying, it's a broad-based index, it's 1256. Nine or fewer, it's narrow, it's a security. Again, options on broad-based indexes have the same treatment as the underlying. If you trade forward Forex contracts, and most of you trade spot, but if you trade forwards and you make a opt-out election into 1256G, on the main currencies for which futures trade, that's 1256, G, foreign currency contracts. Now, we make a case for spot Forex too. We're covering Forex later. Options on commodities futures ETFs structured as publicly traded partnerships. The ETF itself is, is sort of like a security, but the option on the commodities futures ETF, we believe, is 1256. Again, you may not have it that treated that way on the 1099B. Next, CBO listed options on volatility ETNs structured as prepaid forward contracts or as debt instruments. So the option on the VXX, the option on the ETN structured as a debt instrument, because it's trading on a CBOE, we believe it's a non-equity option. And the next is non-equity options. That's actually the catch-all that so many of the above items I just gave you fit into. Non-equity options. And lastly, Forex over-the-counter OTC options. First they were barred, then they were allowed, then they were barred again. Finally, the right appellate court said they're 1256. You really want to know it's 1256 and don't just rely on the 1099B. A lot of the brokers get, you know, designation of security versus commodity or, or 1256 from the exchanges. And the exchanges are not that, you know, they're not giving tax advice. And you'll see when we suggest you can consider departing. And it's really meaningful to a lot of people. Because these contracts in 1256 have lower 6040 tax rates, meaning 60%, including day trades, are long-term capital gains. You don't have to wait a year. Just on a day trade, you get a 60% long-term capital gains component. 40% is short-term at the ordinary rate. When you do the math at the maximum tax bracket for 2018, the blended 60-40 rate comes out to 26.8%. That's 10.2% lower than the highest ordinary rate of 37%. That's a nice savings. You don't need trader tax status for that. And there are significant savings throughout the income brackets. Because remember, in the lowest two brackets, 10 and 12%, the long-term rate is zero. I have all those blended rates on our website in the tax center under financial products under 1256. You'll see all those brackets. Now, with 1256, it's got built-in mark-to-market accounting, actually on a daily basis. It means that you're reporting both realized, the ones you sell, and unrealized gains and losses at year end. You may not have a lot of unrealized gains and losses. It's because of this mark-to-market 
that Congress negotiated 60-40 because they didn't get a chance to get a long-term rate if you have to mark to market year end. So with MTM and summary reporting, which is required, brokers, they can issue a one-page 1099B for 1256 contracts, and they report aggregate profit or loss on contracts after taking into account the realized and unrealized gains and losses. They'll show you what's realized. They'll show you the adjustment for unrealized at the beginning and end of the year, and they'll show you the aggregate. And you simply report that aggregate profit or loss on Form 6781 Part 1, which breaks it down to the 60-40 split that then moves over to the Schedule D. Now, there's a nice loss carryback election on Form 6781. You can check the box to select the 1256 loss carryback election. You'll put in what the loss is, but then you'll, you won't take it on the current year rather than deducting the loss in the current tax year when you may not need it because you'll you see, hey, I'm going to have a capital loss carryover. You can deduct it on amended tax return filings but only against 1256 gains only. And it's a three-year carry back. You got to go back three years first and any unused amounts are then carried forward. So you want to do it right. A lot of people will turn to a firm like us to help them do it right. But it's a nice nifty loss carry back election. And the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, they repeal the NOL carry back, except if you're a farmer. For traders, it's gone. But they didn't say anything about this loss carry back election, I guess because it's so rarely used. Let's move on to the next category. Options. A lot of people increasingly have gotten interested in, you know, trading options. The tax treatment is diverse. There's simple trades, outrights, and there's complex options trades with offsetting positions. You can trade options on securities. You can trade options on 1256 contracts. You can trade options on all sorts of financial instruments. There's no one set of rules. The options cover the gamut of tax treatment. As a general rule, they are a derivative of their underlying instrument and sometimes have the same tax treatment. For example, equity options are a derivative of the underlying equity and both are Tax as securities. So your equity options, they're securities, and they include the equity or stock options, the options on your narrow-based indexes, because remember, the narrow-based index was tax as a security, your options on your securities ETFs, like the SPY, that's organized as a registered investment company. Those are your equity options, your securities. Your non-equity options, you remember that catch-all, they're your 1256 contracts, so options on your futures, options on your broad-based indexes, because both of those underlyings were 1256, options on commodities ETFs organized as publicly traded partnerships. The publicly traded partnership is not really a security. It's, it's a little bit of a different vehicle, so we, we believe you can treat it as a non-equity option. CBOE listed options on your volatility ETNs, whether they're structured as prepaid forward contracts or as debt instruments. We've had a separate webinar on this. We have blog posts on it. We've made a case as a firm to treat it as 1256. Some brokers don't, some do, but we make a case to treat it as a non-equity option. And you want to check that content to see what the position is, to see what the substantial authority position is, and to see if you need an illegal opinion or not. So I want you to delve further into some of these items with our other content. This is more of a big picture. Lastly on this list, Forex OTC options because of the right court case. Now, simple options trades are a little easier. It's sort of like buying and selling. So what you're doing is you're buying and selling call and put options. These are known as outrights. The tax treatment on an outright option trade is relatively straightforward. It's similar to reporting securities of 1256 contracts. 1256 is simple. It's just 
aggregate profit or loss, but with securities, you got the wash sale issues. But you know, the holding period, short term, long term, it's pretty straightforward. Holding period issues can get very complicated when you go to assignments, when you go to complex trades. That's beyond the scope of today's content, but it's in the guide and in some of the older blog posts on our website. We go through all of that in detail. Complex options trades is when things get a lot more complicated. They're known as your option spreads. They include your multi-legged offsetting positions like iron condors, butterfly spreads, vertical, horizontal, and diagonal spreads, debited credit spreads. Those are all the fancy terminology. The tax treatment for complex trades triggers a bevy of sophisticated IRS rules geared toward preventing taxpayers from tax avoidance schemes. So you can imagine a lot of people use these complex trades to book losses one year, let the profits run, to try to fool around to get a long-term capital gain. The IRS has all these rules to prevent you from doing so, straddle rules, wash sale rules, and more. So the, the rules prevent you from deducting losses and expenses from the losing side of a complex trade in the current tax year while deferring income on the offsetting winning position until the subsequent year. Now, you can actually do it, but you got to like get out of it. You got to have some more risk opened up in the next year. And again, it's beyond the scope of today's conversation, but it's in our other content. Three things can happen with outright simple option trades. You can trade the option close out the transaction and use it to qualify for trader tax status. You can let the option expire worthless, lapses. That's like a closing trade, but it doesn't count for trader tax status volume. Or you can exercise the option and get the underlying stock or sell the stock. Now, there are special rules for the holding period for long-term capital gains. You're not going to game the system on the long-term capital gains. I cover all that in the guide, so get the guide for that. Let's move on to the next area. So again, on options, you got to really dig deeper with our content beyond the scope. It could be a whole webinar on its own. Let's talk about exchange-traded funds, ETFs. There's been an explosion of them, of every stripe. It's sort of like every flavor of uh, ice cream. So there are securities, ETFs, commodities, precious metals, and they use different structures and different tax treat and the tax treatment varies. You got your securities ETFs. They're generally registered investment companies, RICs. They're listed on securities exchanges. And selling a securities ETF is deemed the sale of a security that calls for short-term and long-term capital gains treatment on the realization method, the cash method. If you keep it open, it's deferred. If you trade ETFs and elect 475, it's securities, it would apply, 475 would apply. Wash sales apply because securities. Now, your commodities ETFs, they get a little more confusing. They're not allowed to be a registered investment company by the regulators, so they use the publicly traded partnership structure. And once you start talking about a partnership structure, you might get an annual schedule K-1, which is sent to partners if you hold on to it long enough, which will pass through some income or loss, which might be 1256 tax treatment on 1256 transactions. So the K-1 is telling you, hey, we're passing this income through to you. You got to put it on your tax return. If you don't, the IRS will match it and find it's missing. And they may pass through some losses. All right, so you pick up that income. Now, when you sell your commodity ETF, again, that's deemed the sale of a security. You're not selling a commodity. It's not a commodity. It's not a future. You're selling a security. It's short-term and long-term capital gains treatment. But you're not done. You need to adjust the cost basis on the commodities ETFs. Taxpayers invested in commodities futures ETFs should adjust cost basis on Form 8949 capital gains and losses, ensuring they don't double count the Schedule K-1 pass-through items. If they pass through $10,000 of 
uh, form 6781-1256 income, and you pick up that income, but you didn't get a check from the company, they didn't pay you the money, they just told you to pick up the income, you got to add that to your cost basis so that when you sell it, you back out that 10000 and you don't pay taxes twice on it. Now, again, your 1099B is not going to do this for you. It, it doesn't make that cost basis adjustment for you. They don't see that K1. Even the trade accounting software doesn't see it or, or do it. You got to make that adjustment manually. Next, precious metals ETFs. Well, they're not allowed to be RICs. They're not even allowed to be publicly traded partnerships, physically backed precious metals ETFs. They use the publicly traded trust structure, otherwise known as a grantor trust. It's sort of like, uh, it's a look through uh, instrument. A PTT issues an annual tax reporting statement, passing through some tax treatment to investor, which in this case is the collectibles rate on sales of physically backed precious metals. So it's almost as if you own the underlying gold bullion indirectly, but it's almost like you own it. And selling a precious metals ETF is deemed like you're selling that precious metal where the collectibles rate applies. How does the collectibles rate apply? If you hold it over one year, Sales of the of the are taxed at the collectibles rate, which is your ordinary rate. It's not a long-term rate, it's your ordinary rate, but they cap the rate at 28%. It's interesting that they lowered the ordinary rates in the tax cut bill, but they didn't lower this collectibles rate. 28%, that that sounds like the 60-40 highest rate. Now, so the your GLD is this PTT, publicly traded trust structure. Now, we happen to think the options on the GLD are, sort, again, a non-equity option. So the options on the GLD probably get 60-40, but it's not 100% clear. Now, here's the problem. The IRS hasn't explicitly stated tax treatment on sales of options based on ETFs. Our position, I believe, is a conservative one. If it's an option on the securities ETF, which is a RIC, we think that's an option on a security, a tax as a security. But an options on a commodities ETF structured as a publicly traded partnership is 1256. And the options on the GLD, we think, is 1256. All right. We've covered a lot. Let's uh, take a short uh, break for me to just drink something, and we're going to get into Forex. See how we're doing on timing. Pretty good. Now with Forex, that's when you're in the interbank market, trading with a broker like IB or other uh, RFED or FCM Forex dealers. You want it, you can get the best of both worlds on your taxes. You start off with ordinary income or loss treatment in Section 988. And that's nice if you have a big loss and you can use it. Or you can elect a capital gains treatment and get a chance to get the lower 6040 rates in 1256G. Have your cake and eat it too. You got to do it up front. Now, Forex transactions start off receiving an ordinary gain or loss treatment as dictated by Section 988 foreign currency transactions. That's what all your manufacturers are doing worldwide, buying and selling goods across uh, countries. Now, inside of Section 988, they have this capital gains election if you're holding it as a capital asset, as an investor or a trader. A manufacturer can't do it, but you can do this as a trader. You can internally, in your own books and records, file a contemporaneous election. That means today, it applies to today and tomorrow. It doesn't apply to yesterday. You can file this capital gains election to opt out of Section 988 into a capital gain or loss treatment. Again, this is Forex in the interbank market. This is not your currency regulated futures contracts. These, this is Forex. Now, you can make or retract this capital gains election 
on a good to cancel basis at any time during the year. So you can elect it today to apply it later today and tomorrow. And you change your mind a couple months, you can retract it. You want to be consistent and honest about it. Now, your end game with the capital gains election. Now, you may want the capital gains election just to use up a capital loss carryover. But if you don't have a capital loss carryover and you want a shot at the lower 60-40 rates, here's what's involved. The capital gains election really applies on Forex forwards because when Congress added 1256G in the mid-80s after they had earlier added 1256, there weren't any spot trading. Spot trading only came about with the retailization of, of the trading programs after the Commodity Futures Modernization Act of 2000. So the IRS didn't contemplate the spot trading. So this is a very complicated area. We've done a lot of work in this area. So the Forex forwards allow the trader to use 1256G with the lower 6040 capital gains rates on the major currencies if the trader doesn't take or make delivery of the money. So that really doesn't happen. You're out of the position where you do a rollover trade. Major currencies means that the currency pairs also trade on futures or ex as futures on futures exchanges. So just Google FX futures and you'll go to like the CME and you'll see all the pairs that trade on the U.S. futures exchanges. And those are what's defined as majors because the IRS figure is figuring if you can trade the futures and Forex, they don't want people to arbitrage the two and play games. They want to give that red carpet into 1256G. Now, we make a case for including spot Forex on a blog post that we made freely available. It's called a case for retail Forex traders using 1256 lower 6040 rates. You'll find that on our website. You'll find it on the Forex page of the Trader Tax Center. So you go to the Trader Tax Center, Tax on Financial Products, and then the sub page for Forex. A lot of today's content is actually drawn from the Tax Center. Now, when you're involved with Forex, Here's how you handle the tax reporting. It's summary reporting, like the futures. That's good because it would be very difficult to do the line-by-line -line reporting, even to calculate on your own. It's very confusing with Forex. And most brokers are offering a good online tax report. You just look at the, the last page for the summary. The broker's not supposed to issue a 1099B for spot Forex. Section 98, 988 is realized gain of loss. So if you're staying in 988, it's realized gains and losses only, not unrealized. But if you're using 1256G, then, hey, you need to use mark to market and pick up the unrealized gains and losses and do that work yourself on the tax reporting because the broker is only reporting realized. It gets a little bit more complicated with rollovers and rollover interest and things like that. And I cover that in the guide. So let's now go to other financial products in just one second. We're covering a lot of information today. Don't forget, you can go back and watch the recording. You can click on the notes and get the PowerPoint presentation. You can come to our website, go to the guide where there's more in-depth information. This You just want this to resonate in your mind so that you grab a concept and maybe you realize you're doing something wrong today, or your accountant did something wrong, and you can then follow up. There's a lot of other financial products or instruments. There's foreign futures, precious metals. We talked about the precious metals ETF, but we'll talk about precious metals themselves. There are other types of volatility products. We touched on some, the ETNs, and your swap contracts. First, let's start with foreign futures. So you're, you have IB account, access to the world, many global markets. You're trading foreign futures in a, in a foreign exchange. They're listed on exchanges located outside of the U.S. And by default, the first thing that goes off in your mind is, hey, this is probably not a 1256 contract. 
Now, some foreign futures exchanges have applied for and received a no action letter from the CFTC permitting the foreign exchange to market their products to U.S. customers. Many accountants and clients make a mistake when they see that CFTC permission letter, no action letter. They think that, hey, that means it's 1256. It's not. It's halfway there, but it's not all the way there. That foreign futures exchange also wants 1256 tax breaks. Some of them do, some of them don't. If they want 1256, they need to apply for it and receive it, granted permission, in an IRS revenue ruling, which is a published document available to all of us. There's only been a handful of exchanges that have 1256 treatment. You can see the list in this link here. ENY puts out a good list every year. Uh, and it includes Eurex, Life, Ice Futures Europe, Ice Futures Canada. Not much more than that. That's about it. There's a few more that are inactive. So uh, there was a famous exchange that was going around telling everyone they had 1256. I said they didn't. They looked it up. They realized they didn't. They had to take it off their site in France. So next, precious metals. Physical precious metals or collectibles, which are a particular class of capital asset. If you hold collectibles over a year, the sales are taxed at collectibles tax rate. The taxpayer's ordinary rate of cap to 28%. We sort of went over this previously. If you hold collectibles one year or less, the short-term capital gains rate applies. No different from uh, short-term capital gains. So it's really, you're worried about the difference in the rates if you're in an ordinary rate that's greater than 28%. If you're making a lot of money, you very well may be. Volatility products. We had a separate webinar on this. There are many different types of volatility-based financial products to trade and tax treatment varies. We've had a lot of clients come to us this year. They've either made a lot of money or they've had some blow-ups with these volatility products. And whether it's a wash sale or their 475 election could give them tax loss insurance, or they had a capital loss limitation. They really wanted to know where they stand or what they could do about it. Now, for example, the CBOE volatility index, the symbol VIX, those futures, they're 1256 contracts because they're regulated futures contracts. The NYSE traded SVXY, so it's on a, it's on a securities exchange. It's an exchange traded fund. It's taxed as a security. The IPATH S&P 500 VIX short-term futures, the VXX, the biggest ETN, that's an exchange-traded note. Now, as soon as you see, so you want to look at what the name says. If it says ETF, it leads you down one road. If it says ETN, it leads you down another road. Now, the tax treatment of ETNs, it's similar to ETFs, but there are some differences. So on your volatility exchange-traded notes, many issuers structure them as prepaid forward contracts like the VIX, the, excuse me, the VXX. That provides deferral of taxes until sale, the realization, long-term capital gains rates apply if held 12 months or longer. So it's sort of like treated like a security, but it's not a security. So prepaid forward contracts are not securities, which means they are not subject to war sale loss adjustments. And the Section 475, if elected by traders, Eligible for trader tax status does not apply. So if you had a, a ETN prepaid forward contract blow up on you earlier this year and you had a 475 election, you're out of luck. You can't use 475 because it's not a security. Now, conversely, some ETNs like Velocity Shares, three times long NTRL GS ETN, the symbol UGAZ, UGAZ, that's structured as a debt instrument. That's taxed like a security, which means the wash sale loss rules apply and the 475 uh, applies to bail you out. The wash sales may not be good if you had the big loss in December and got back in in January. So check our content. I have a list of all the top ETNs, and I tell you whether it's prepaid forward contract or a security so you know where you stand. And again, your options 
on these volatility ETNs, whether they're prepaid or debt instruments, whether they're securities or not, the CBOE listed options on them, they're non-equity options and they're 1256. We make a case for it, even if the broker doesn't report it that way. Now, swap contracts. A lot of you are not involved trading swaps. They may clear on a commodities exchange, but the IRS said they're not 60-40. They're ordinary gain or loss. Now, some people trade on Nadex, qualified border exchange, but they're, they're swap contracts. We don't believe they're true options. We believe that they should have ordinary gain or loss treatment, but Nadex issues a 1099B treating it as 1256. They probably wanted to report something. If you're trading Nadex for currencies, we think it's definitely ordinary. So check our content on that. It's a small area. Now, let's take another short break to drink something. We're getting into our last area, cryptocurrencies. Let's see how we're doing on timing. Doing pretty good. 12.47. We're going on the hour. All right, so you got your Bitcoin, your Ethereum, all your Litecoin, all the different cryptocurrencies, all the rage in 2017, still the rage for traders in 2018. Market exploded in 2017, a lot of Bitcoin and uh, cryptocurrency millionaires. A lot of people haven't paid their taxes for 2017. They did those coin-to-coin -coin trades. They thought they could defer the game with the Litecoin exchange. They have a massive tax bill. They're coming around to realizing it. They filed extensions. They haven't paid the taxes yet. The final tax day for American crypto is October 15th when people were on extension. They were hoping for the markets to recover. A lot of the money in those markets belongs to the IRS. It's going to be interesting to see how it unwinds. Thomas Lee said, oh, the tax law selling is before April 15th. Wrong. Tax law selling is before October 15th. That's when people, coin traders are holding their holders until then. They're trading still, but they're still holders of some underlying, hoping for the price to recover to pay the tax bill. Now, that was a little... Uh, commentary. Let's get back to the tax treatment. It, selling, exchanging, or using cryptocurrency triggers capital gains and losses for investors. A lot of people are not really following the rules properly. Cryptocurrency is intangible property. When cryptocurrency users, the, the users may call it digital money. That was the idea. It's a new form of money. But the IRS said, wait a second. It's not sovereign government issued money. We don't want that competition. Maybe we'll have our own crypto, but we don't want the competition. So every use of cryptocurrency is a taxable event. It's sort of like you're holding on to a lot of corn and you're, you're using barter around town. You're giving the dentist corn. You're giving the accountant corn. Every time you use your corn, it's a taxable event. No wonder people hardly ever use Bitcoin to buy stuff. It's expensive to do so. It doesn't clear so fast. Bitcoin Cash does clears a little faster. But it's not really the digital money that it was purported to be initially. It's more like digital gold. But the SEC has labeled some ICO uh, initial coin offering tokens They've labeled some as securities, but they did say Bitcoin and Ethereum is not a security. Some CFTC officials have called cryptocurrency a commodity, but it ha that's not clear. doesn't really matter what they say. The IRS needs to say what their position is. Now, if it was 100% clear that all cryptocurrency was a security, the IRS may change its tune, but right now they still call it intangible property. Bingo. No wash sales, no 475 intangible property. Yeah, the AICPA has asked to use 475, so have we, but that's not the rule really for intangible property. So capital gains and losses. If you invested in cryptocurrencies and sold some, 
for fiat currency, for dollars. Or you exchange some Bitcoin for another coin like Ethereum. I mean, you got to be in Bitcoin or Ethereum to then trade in all the other altcoins. At least that was the case I know last year. So you're in the coin to coin trading. Or you spend some, you bought a, a boat or something like that or a hotel room for each use. You have to report a capital gain on each transaction and do the line by line reporting. So that includes your coin to currency sales, your coin to coin trades, and purchases of goods or services using a coin or a part of a coin. Now, when you hold on to your Bitcoin, you got your Bitcoin cash, your Bitcoin gold. That was a chain split or a hard fork. And there's a lot of those that go on. A lot of them fail. A lot of times they don't trade. You don't get access to it on your Coinbase account or your Coin Exchange account. You don't have dominion and control over it. There's no fair market value. So you probably don't have to pick up income in those cases. But like with Bitcoin Cash, which you didn't get in your wallet, it was not initially supported on Coinbase. But if you got control in your wallet and there was a trading value on day one, it was a wide across the board, but let's say it was 266, you probably should pick up that other income when you got control of it. So that's a little of a tricky area, not 100% clear. If it's not clear, okay, you defer the income recognition until sale. There's a lot of imputed income. There were no 1099s in this area. A lot of Coinbase holders were really shocked to get that 1099K at year end for 2017. So the big problem for the IRS is that many crypto transactions are not evident for tax reporting, including coin-to-coin -coin trades, hard forks, which are chain splits, using a coin to purchase goods or services. It, it may not be that evident, and the trader doesn't realize it's it's a it's a taxable transaction or the investor. The investor should impute a sale or exchange transaction to report the gain or loss on coin to coin trades and using coin to purchases. You need coin software for this trade accounting software. Now, there are problems with like coined exchanges. The new tax law bars. Section 1031 like kind exchanges on intangible property starting in 2018. They retain it for real property only. So if you own a commercial building and you exchange it for another commercial building, you have a way to defer the income through cost basis. It's very complicated rule, Section 1031. That's what it was really intended for. But in two th prior to 2018, 1031 purportedly could apply to intangible property and property, you know, a car or something like that. Um, and a lot of crypto traders figured, hey, I'm going to do these 1031 deferrals for my coin to coin trades. I'm not going to trade coin for fiat. But it's got to be like kind property. Is Ethereum like kind property with Bitcoin? My partner, Darren Neuschwander, and I don't think it is. But there's not a lot of information about that. The IRS has not really said. Now, even if it is like-kind property, this is for before 18. This year going forward, it's not even on the table. But I'm talking about all those people who deferred 015, 16, 17. They've been deferring it to 2018. They haven't paid any taxes. And they lost the money in the markets now as a holder. And what are they going to do to square up with the IRS? They're counting on these like kind exchanges. There's other requirements that you have to comply with in Section 1031, like a qualified intermediary. And I don't think that Coinbase and these coin exchanges, I don't think it was truly a like kind exchange with a qualified intermediary. Now, this gets into the weeds a bit. This is for the past. We have this content on our site. Go back and take a look at that if you're using like-kind exchanges. And by the way, we think you probably should use FIFO for your trading because 
whilst property can have specific identification, you didn't actually do that on a contemporaneous basis, unless you did. Most people didn't, but unless you did, use FIFO. Now, Coinbase, which is the largest U.S. crypto exchange, they got busted by the IRS, had a John Doe summons, had to turn over a lot of accounts that were had a lot of 200 or more transactions and some other metrics. And they used those same metrics to issue 1099Ks to qualifying customers if they were over specific volume thresholds. That's on our website. Now, the IRS intended 1099K for business, for merchants, for reporting payment card and third-party network transactions. Like when you pay our CPA firm through a credit card, we get that 1099K. It wasn't, you know, 1099Bs are supposed to be for trading, not 1099Ks. Everybody's trying to catch up here so far behind. This, the IRS has let this thing go. It is a huge mess. It's going to be like the offshore bank accounts. People are going to get busted. It's going to be a bad scene. So that's, yeah, get your coin trade accounting software, communicate with someone who knows the rules, get squared up in a good manner, and stay ahead of the game on your taxes for your coin trading. Okay. So that was all the areas that we were going to cover today. We're going to get to some questions now. And let's see here. We're at 12.57. We did good on the time for the content. We're going to go about 15 minutes on the questions. So before we do so, get your questions ready. Put them up on the panel. Stick to today's content for the questions. If I said something was beyond the scope, then don't bring me into the weeds here. Try to keep it short and brief. We'll try to answer a question for each person who asks a question, not multiple questions. So again, you want to come over to greentradertax.com. You want to give us a call, 203-456-1537 or 888-558-5257. You want to email us. If we don't get to your question today, send over an email to info at greentradertax.com. I'll see those and our admin team will see those. I'll try to reply to the questions. And then let me actually move over to the website, quickly show you here on the, here's the website, here's the tax center. You see the drop down? Drop down a tax treatment on financial products. So let's do that. And then notice on the right side here for explore the tax center, you have securities capitalists, carryovers of Form 89, 49, 1099B issues, wash sales, options. This kind of mirrors what we did today, but it has even more information. And then you want to go over to the guide for the premium content. Also look on the blog, look at the events for prior recordings. A lot of them are from IB. I'm doing a lot of my events with IB now. That's It's a nice relationship that we have going. So, and then you'll go to the contact us page and you can send us a web con you know, form or an email or call us or. So let's now look at some of your questions. Let me expand that. All right. So Thomas L, I'll just give the last initial. I, don't, I want to keep the anonymity. Can you get 475 trading only stock options? If you're a trader in securities and or commodities, which is like your 1256 contracts, you can elect as a taxpayer 475 if you qualify for trader tax status on securities only, commodities only, or both securities and commodities. So if you're an individual, you might have an investment account on the side, but you have a trading account for trader tax status, and you elect it on securities only, so you retain the lower 60-40 tax rates on your 1256 contracts. But if you're trading equities and you're trading equity options, you're not electing 475 just on the equity options. It would apply to your equities too because you're electing on securities, which includes all the securities that you trade. All right, Neil C. I have been told that as a Forex trader, the U.S. pairs have a better U.S. tax treatment for non-U.S. pairs. Um, yeah, that's sort of true because remember, if there's a U.S. pair, it's a major, and you can navigate on your Forex for which there's a U.S. 
pay, uh, future, futures pair, you can navigate for that Forex into 1256G and get the lower 6040 rates. So again, come over to the website. Let me bring that up. I'll show you where to go for that. You go to Tax Center. You drop down. You go to Tax Treatment on Financial Products. You go over to the Forex Tax Treatment here and Explore. You would bring up the Forex page. You'd read what's on that page, and you would see there's a link here to a case for, for that article I was talking about, and you would read this article about the case to be made and understand it and follow up with us about it. Let's go back to the questions. We open those up again. All right. So Benjamin B., are weekly SPX options considered 1256? So SPX, that sounds like the index on the exchanges. So what you do is anytime you get, you have a symbol, you come over to Google and you go SPX, put in the symbol. Let me close the screen. And you see here, okay, the Yahoo Finance came up, which is sort of what you want. And you see here, S&P 500 index, bingo, index, that's going to be 1256. It's not saying ETF or ETN. And you see it's index CBOE. It's on the a commodities exchange and it's index. Right off the bat now, that's coding for that you know it's uh, 1256. Now, let's, let's do the same thing with SPY. All right, so you bring up SPY. You go, want to go to your Yahoo Finance because you got that summary there. And what do you see here? SPDR, S&P 500. You see ETF. Bingo, you know it's ETF, it's not an index. And also, bingo, you see it's NYSE ARCA. That's NASDAQ real time. That's a securities exchange. So you know it's a security, it's an ETF, it's a security, it's a RIC. If it said, like let's say that we did this now, we did the same thing, we went to VXX. And so it said, it said NYSE ARCA, so it's a securities exchange, VXX. It said Barclays, all that's fine, VIX, whatever. It says ETN, bingo, it's an ETN. Now, is it a prepaid forward contract where it's not subject to wash sales, not subject to 475, or is it a debt instrument like you guys that is wash sales on 475? What you now need to do next is go to EX, VXX Prospectus, go to the Prospectus, and then you want to go to the tax center section of the Prospectus, I'm not going to do all that now. And you want to see, is it a debt instrument or is it a prepaid forward contract? You don't need to do all that. You could go into our tax center, go to tax treatment on financial products, go to exchange, go to other financial products, scroll down to volatility products, see these different uh, blog posts I have, go to this last one on ETNs. And I got a list right here of the top ETNs and which ones are prepaid and which ones are not. VXX, VXXB, VXZ, XVZ, uh, VXEB, they're all prepaid. But then all of a sudden the VIIX is debt security. That's 12, uh, That's going to be wash sales on 475, so you read the blog post. So I'm showing you how to find these answers on your own using our content and how we do things as a firm. So you can get good at it yourself. Let me go back to the questions. I like the way this is going because I'm getting a chance to show you how to do stuff. Uh, Less S. If I own a stock that is showing a loss and I sell a put with an expiration, can I sell stock? Right, this is going to get a little complicated for the wash sale. I don't. Anytime someone takes me into one of those, it can get a little beyond the scope of what we need to do. So. If you take a loss in the stock and you get back into a substantially identical position in the underlying in the option on that stock, whether it's a call or a put, long or short, then within 30 days before or after, you're going to have a wash sale and a deferral. So look at our content and see how TradeLog handles it. They give you a free demo. You can try a trial version, see how it handles it. It can, it can be a real tongue twister. So I'm sorry, Les, I don't want to give you a full answer there and go down that rabbit hole for today's uh, session. Uh, I'm answering multiple questions because let's see how many we have. A lot of you have them, and we'll see how we're doing on timing. Uh, Benjamin B. again, 
Thank you for your nice comment about the outstanding presentation. Uh, yes, you can schedule a paid consultation. Just come over to the website, click on services. You know, we put out a lot of content. We have the premium content, but that's not our core business. Our core business is the consultations, the compliance, which is preparation and planning, entity formations, the accounting, IRS representation. So click on consulting, see how that works. You buy now. Then you, you take a 45-minute paid consultation with me, you purchase it, and then you schedule online right away. Bingo, works out, and you get a great memo at the end. So uh, thanks for asking about that. And you can usually get on my calendar within a day or two. And that's what I do most of the day is content and consultations and entity formations. And the rest of our CPAs do all the tax compliance services. And they're real busy now preparing 2017 tax returns. And by the way, we used to charge for the client evaluation. We don't anymore. So you can get an evaluation from my partner, and we can prepare your 2017 tax returns that are on extension, but get to us right away. Uh, Sarah J., if I have trader tax status and select 1256 treatment for spot forex, will that qualify as earned income? No. Remember, all your trading gains are not earned income. You're not paying payroll taxes. You're not paying FICA. You're not paying Medicare. Unless you're trading futures as a member of a futures exchange, as a full member, and that's rare. So you're not, with all the various elections and trader tax status and 475, none of that is creating earned income. You need the S Corp to pay your salary to unlock the health insurance and the retirement plan deduction. And then you only have payroll tax on the retirement plan wages, not on the health insurance portion. That's all we've covered in other webinars on setting up a trading business. So go back and watch that. You remember, Cynthia told you, you go over to the, our website or the IB website, you look at prior webinar recordings and they're all right there. Uh, DWT. Please put link for the 1256 futures in the chat windows. Let me show you how to get there again. So you go to Tax Center, go down to Tax Treatment on Financial Products. That's what we're doing today. Go over to the 1256 contracts. So now you're on the 1256 contracts and scroll down. Here's the 018 rates. And then here are the blended rates for 017, and here are the blended rates for 018. So if you're in the 24% bracket, your blended rate, instead of uh, your ordinary rate is 24%, your long-term rate is 15, your 40% rate is 9.6, your long-term is 9, your blended rate is 18.6. That's 5.4% less than the ordinary rate. That's a really nice savings. So these are, in the 35% rate, it's 12% less. That's the biggest savings. So that's in here on that page. So that was... Uh, I could put it in the chat window for you as well, um, or I could put it in the answering the question. So let's go to the next question now. Mike A. I just started trading in Feb of this year, so I didn't have opportunity to file TTS MTM. Well, Mike, you can claim trader tax status February through now through year end for your business expense deductions. There's no election for trader tax status, but there is an election for Section 475. And yes, it sounds like you missed that election deadline as an individual taxpayer, which was April 17th, 2018 for 2018. But you could form a new entity to elect 475 and claim TTS in the entity to elect 475 within 75 days of the entity. And in fact, you say on your question, if I formed an entity like S Corp this year, could I register the entity for MTM for 2018? Yes, if it's still within 75 days of the entity formation and, and inception date. So it's re real important to establish what was the inception date, probably when you got the EIN. So you want to check with me on that. What was the inception date and can you still make the deadline? Uh, you forgot to mention I definitely qualified for TTS. Good. You had significant gains year to date. Good. So uh, if you're going to be over the um, taxable income married of 315000 as a service business with 475, which likely includes 475 for the, this is the new tax laws, 20% deduction. 
So it's a, it's a service business. Sounds like you'll be over the threshold. But in the phase out range, remember you got an extra hundred thousand over the threshold of 315. It's only when you go over married 415 that as a service business with QBI, which likely includes 475 but excludes capital gains, that you would get that 20% pass through deduction. I wrote up that blog post uh, yesterday. My editor will get it done by tomorrow. So look for a whole blog post about the IRS regulations about how traders can take advantage of the 20% pass-through deduction, which likely includes 475 income. And you were touching on that. A DW again, can you claim a loss in Bitcoin, stolen or lost? Uh, that's a whole other issue, but generally you want to look at theft, and, and I think it's 165. So uh, I'll cover that more later. That may not be uh, a regular capital loss. You want to look at theft. Uh, issues and we've covered that before with, uh, with issues like the Madoff and other uh, Ponzi schemes. Um, so Keith L, I trade the U.S. Mexican uh, currency and U.S. South African. So what you want to do is you want to see if you see those pairs on the CME. So again, go back to Google and. So let me close, bring down the questions, close the questions. You would go to, you would go to CME, at, uh, one second. You would go to FX CME. You go to FX product CME. You'd bring that up and you would go to the product list. And you would see, you'd go through the list of, of the pairs. You would see the majors, the emerging markets. It doesn't matter. If they have it, even if they call it emerging markets, if they have the pair here, you're going to get it. E&Y puts out a nice list as well. So just do a little Google work there. Uh, let's go back to the questions. We're going to go to 130 max. But let's see if we'll, when we're done here with the questions. We've had some good questions here. Brian R., what is your firm's tax position on trading contracts for difference? Okay. We always have uh, a position on most things that people ask about. We have a position. Now, I don't know if I put contracts for di difference in other financial products here. Let's see if it's in there or not. In fact, I should add it because I do have a blog post about it. Swap. Well, I have swaps in here. Okay. And... So read, so it's really, it's a swap contract, and I talk about contracts for difference, but there's a blog post here. So it's part of swap contracts. So read this blog post. It's it's not a security, it's not a commodity, it's not 475, it's not war sales. There are regulators have problems with it. And, and what the tax treatment is, it swaps, it's other income or loss on line 21. So it's, we. so you can always come to the website and go down to the bottom of the page, and you can always search, put something, contracts for difference, you can always put in, and then bingo, it comes right up, and then you could view that. So you can use search too. Let's go back to the questions. If there's something that a lot of traders are involved with and have questions about, it usually finds its way to my desk in a consultation or from my partners, who are seeing it in tax compliance. And if it's important enough that it's more than just one person, I'm going to tackle it for the client. And then whatever I come up with my content for the client, I'm going to turn that into, into structural capital and make it available to a lot of traders and write a blog about it, do research on it, fight for better treatment on it. That's our model. And I think it works well for all of you. And it works well for us. Uh, Stephanie M., do war sale rules apply, extend to crypto sales? Well, probably not because it's not a security. But, you know, the AICPA and my partner, Darren Neuschwander, is on that task for us. They've sent some nice letters over to the AICPA. And I've raised a lot of these issues myself. And I think they drew some of the ideas for me, but much wider audience. And they put a lot more thought into it. And they're a great task force, my partner included, Darren Neuschwander. Um, so RVP, 
Uh, thank you for your nice comment. Excellent presentation, Stephanie M. Any problems? By the way, if you like the presentation, recommend the recording to your friends. I mean, uh, IB does a nice job with the recording. They end up on YouTube, on their site, on our site. Uh, so Stephanie M., and any problems with losses in crypto being applied to gains and other? Well, remember the nice thing about in securities, the nice thing about crypto is it is capital gains and losses. So if you've had a large capital loss carryover from trading securities in the past or 1256 contracts, and you got a big gain in crypto as a capital gain, it will soak up your entire capital loss carryover. Capital losses are only limited against capital gains. I mean, against ordinary income, they're unlimited against capital gains. Uh, David H., you mentioned that the annual carryback provisions have been eliminated. That's for NOLs, but, you, the, but your unlimited NOL carry forwards, they are limited to 80% of the following year's taxable income. How about folks that have carried back from past years? Uh, well, now it's a carry forward, so it's fine. So 2017, you can still do an annual carry back to 2015. It's your 2018 that can't be an annual carry back. So the law only kicks in for 2018. Robert K. Trading securities and futures. Assume I elect 1256 and 481. No, you wanna. You probably want to retain. 1256 on futures to get the look, keep the 1256 lower 60 40 rates and elect 475 on securities only. A 481 adjustment is part of a 475 election that you may have made on April 15, uh, by April 17, 2018. Remember, it's normally April 15th every year, but sometimes it falls on a weekend or a holiday, so it, it goes a few days later. Uh, more nice comments. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and, and you meant 475, Robert. Thank you. Not, but 481 of those adjustments you make with a 475 election. <clears throat> Robert K. On spot forex, where would you report the rollover interest? Rollover interest is usually part of trading gain or loss, so that's a good thing. And so are transaction costs. You just combine it into gain or loss. It's really not separately stated interest. I cover that in the guide. Uh, Alita B. Is the aggregate profit or loss for spot forex reported online? Well, <clears throat> if you're using Section 988 and you don't have trader tax status, it's other income gain or loss with the realized method without MTM on line 21. So it would not be so-called aggregate profit or loss. That implies that it's unrealized too. If you elect 1256G with the capital gains election, then it's on form 6781. I have all those details in the guide. Uh, TJP, plain options on equity indexes 6040. If you have a, a broad based index, it's 1256, and the option on the broad based index is 1256. Robert K., if I trade in entity LP for taxable money and I trade Roth, well, the entity is separate from the Roth, so you don't have the war sale problem. That's another nice reason to have the entity. It's really your individual accounts that have the wash sale problem with the IRA. So let's get a few more questions in here. Let me just take a quick break to drink something. <clears throat> Bob A., if you register for 475, do you have to do it every year? When you elect 475, it stays with you for life as long as you qualify for trader tax status. In any year you don't qualify or a portion of a year you don't qualify, you may not use it. It so-called goes into suspended status. You may revoke the election by April 15th of any given year in the same reverse manner that you elected it. But you just treat it as suspended. So you don't have to re-elect it each year. It's suspended until you re-qualify. Re I cover all that in the guide. TJP, uh, do the new taxes affect prop trading? Uh, not so much. The prop trading rules are on our website, so you go to the website. It's a whole different area than retail trading. You go down to proprietary trading. You read all about that. The firm has independent contractors are not really trading at all. They're getting consulting fees. But LLC members get the trader tax status passed through the firm. Many have 475. Uh, and if it's 475, you might get the 20% pass-through deduction. You might get it in a hedge fund whether you're active or not. 
So that's all covered in our content. You'll see that big blog post tomorrow coming. It's coming tomorrow. And I'll, I might do my next webinar on that pass-through deduction, not just for traders, but for other types of businesses as well, because many of you are traders, but you may also have a consulting business. You may have a restaurant. Your spouse may have that. So you are interested in getting that pass-through deduction. It's a complicated area, and we're staying on top of it. Uh, let's go back to the questions. If you have, uh, this is from Bob A, if you have currency from foreign country exchange or for U.S. currency, if you go into, if you have euros and you sell it for back to dollars, that's ordinary gain or loss, and you can't do the capital gains election. The capital gains election is only for Forex contracts, not for physical currency. If you're holding euros left over from vacation, that was personal use. You can't take a loss on that, and it's a capital gain otherwise if you sell it. But if it's investment property, it's ordinary gain or loss. I have all that covered in our Forex content. We've been on, for, on top of Forex right from the start. Um, there's been less Forex trading because the CFTC wants retail Americans who don't have $10 million or a million dollars in an entity or something like that to be an eligible contract participant. They want them only working with regist CFTC registered brokers or registered with another regulator. A lot of traders have gone to foreign Forex brokers who are not registered with a U.S. regulator. That's in contravention of CFTC rules. And I said the CFTC was going to bust them, and they have busted them. Every month I'm seeing a new Google alert that so-and-so broker is now busted by the CFTC and being sued by the CFTC. And that could have implications for the trader. So I would not get, be in contravention of those rules. And I would work with U.S. registered brokers, Check with IB. I know at one point they went to eligible contract participants, but then I heard something about maybe they were back working with retail. I need to get that answer myself. So follow up with IB on that. But American retail traders should trade with U.S. registered brokers. And, be, you know, FXEM got busted, uh, lo lost their license, you know, registration. So unfortunately, Forex trading has gone down because of those rules. Crypto trading has come up, but uh, Forex was a big area for many, many years. When Green and Company started in 1983, I started with three Forex uh, you know, brokerage firms and, and the leading Forex traders in the world. I've been dealing with them all along. Uh, that, that's all the questions. So uh, let's uh, wrap up here. So what you want to do is, again, is get familiar with the website, send us an email question. And uh, so what you would do is, Go over to the events tab. You see it here in this, in this navigation on the right here. And look at all the recordings. A lot of these are freely available. I mean, they're either free or they're not on the site. So, um, and, it, and it may bring you over to the IB site. It might go right to the YouTube recording that IB puts up. So thank you, everyone, for coming. And we look forward to hearing from you soon. And back to you, Cynthia. Oh, Robert, that was terrific, and uh, you're concluding right on target here today. Now, I want to thank everyone uh, for joining today's session and remind you that we have been recording today's event, and each of you will get a direct link to today's recorded playback later on today, so watch your inbox. By the way, I also do include a hyperlink to um, the PDF copy of Robert's notes from today. So you can access that as well. As Robert mentioned, we'll be um, also posting this on YouTube. It may take us an extra day or two, um, but do watch your email if you want to come back and review any of the concepts that Robert was discussing today. By the way, I also do want you to be aware that we have quite a library of information available on the Interactive Broker website. Go to the Education menu where you can uh, <clears throat> drill down to the webinar section and go into the recorded um, events. Now, those recordings are filterable, and you can filter by presenter. So if you type in Robert Green, you'll find a whole host of webinars that he has done with us as well. So with that, we are going to conclude our event today. And thank you so much, Robert, uh, for today's presentation. Um, 
So with that, you can all exit today's session using the X in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. Have a great rest of your day, everyone, and thanks so much.